Good morning, St. Christopher's. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so excited today. This is a really good friend of mine. Jim and I were in school together. We carpooled together for two years to and from Camp Allen. We actually still speak to each other. Uh, and he is the, a priest of St. James. And I was having a heck of a time finding somebody for today. And I reached out to Jim and he said, absolutely. And uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Jim Harrington, Father Jim Harrington from St. James, and he will be our supply priest today. And uh, unless he messes up really bad, I think you're going to really like him. <laughs> okay, Vicki, my turn. <laughs> yes, I did survive two years with Vicki in the car. <laughs> And we're still friends. And we are. And we are. But it's, it's really kind of interesting to be here today because for 24 years, I have driven by St. Christopher's going to and from the lower canyons of Big Bend. And I never had a chance to be inside until Madeline Hawley was, uh, became your rector. And I actually worked with Madeline at St. James. She was a curate at St. James. So there's a lot of full circle going on here that I'm... Absolutely. Very happy to be part of, yeah. and very happy to be with you all this morning and uh, worship with you. Excellent. All right. Thank you.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ, you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy, that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us from up here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom will I show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today, today is Psalm 99. We'll read it in unison. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses is an heir in all his priests and Samuel upon those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God 
for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
So as I said in the beginning, it's a, it a great honor to be here with you all <laughs> this parish. I'm happy to be here with my friend, Vicki. And uh, we both were in this program, bivocational it's called, sort of a second career, right? We all had earlier careers. Um, ironically, both Vicki and I worked uh, in the same place in the Rio Grande Valley for, I was there for 10 years and Vicki was there for longer. And my prior career as civil rights lawyer, I was the director of the Texas Civil Rights Project for 25 years, been a lawyer 50 years. Um, so it's a, a pleasure to be here and kind of interpret the gospel, the words of the scriptures today, sort of from my experience, uh, being on the ground in a different way. And I am interested today, I think, in the readings. Usually the readings, readings kind of fit together. Today they don't seem they fit together. Sometimes we're in a quandary about why the church even picks the three readings it does because they don't always seem to jive. And sometimes the person doing the sermon is really kind of doing acrobatics, right? To uh, kind of tie all these together somehow. But I think today there's a, there is sort of a, a tie together that I want to talk about in, a, you know, in the context, I think, of particularly of the, or I guess in terms of the gospel. So we know today in the first reading uh, that we continue to track in Exodus the history of freedom, freedom from slavery, the movement of the people from Egypt, the formation of the people of God. This is about the formation of God's community. And we see today, of course, the, through the lens of Moses, who is a hero, but certainly somebody that has uh, human foibles. And just like we all do, sitting here, standing here, have our human foibles. And it's important, I think, to look that Exodus is a story about us too, informing and living in the community. But what struck me about the reading today is that, uh, is how Moses prays. So there are three parts to Moses' prayer today that are kind of interesting. And the technique, I think, is really interesting because this is presented as prayer in conversation with God, right? Conversation with God. I never let a sermon go by without calling, suggesting that we spend more time in the morning doing prayer in a conversation with God. I call it coffee with God. You may not drink coffee, so you can substitute whenever you want. But in the first moments of that morning when it's quiet and peaceful, they have this conversation with God as Moses is doing. Not to sit there and read prayers, but they have a conversation or just be silent, you know, for 15 or 20 minutes or what we call centering prayer. So I'm going to come back to these three parts of the prayer of uh, Moses. The second reading, Paul writing to the people of Thessalonica, praising that community for sticking together for staying united. So we don't know exactly what happened in Thessalonica, but the Christians were persecuted. It may be that a couple were, or some were martyred. We don't quite know, but we do know that because of persecution, the regular stuff happened. Loss of employment, uh, discrimination, all of that that goes on when we persecute people, right? We have all kinds of levels of persecution that we humans can employ. My favorite reading today, though, is uh, the gospel. And when I was a kid, I love this gospel because it's a gotcha gospel, right? Jesus got him. You know, they try to trap him and fool him, right? Well, you know, that's a kid's way of looking at it. And I think we make a mistake 
when we look at it as a gotcha. Because Jesus isn't out there just performing, doing tricks, catching people in traps, and all of that. He's actually there, think about this. He, he is actually, he knows what he's doing. He is training, teaching people, walking with him. This isn't a story that Matthew relates because man, this will be a good story for them later on. This is a story that he's telling, Matthew's telling us that Jesus was part of as a way of teaching us. And what is Jesus teaching us? So you have this coin, right? The hated Roman Empire, the brutal, oppressive Roman Empire. This coin that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are going to use, want to use to trap Jesus to take away his cred, to undermine the fact that people are following him and not listening to them. And so what does Jesus say? The first thing he says, uh, show me a coin, and where is the coin? Where is this hated coin? It's in their pockets. Hypocrites, he says. You hypocrites. You can pause a moment and consider how many times we are hypocritical when we criticize people. But the point I think that Jesus is making in this discussion about render unto the government what belongs to the government and unto God what belongs to God is that Jesus is saying, I think very clearly here, that we have a responsibility to live in a civil society. That's fine. But that civil society has got to comport to the will of God. We don't have a split society, right? We can go out and do what we want here and then come to church on a Sunday, get absolution, and it's all cool. I think that's what Jesus is saying. That's not cool, right? So if that's the issue, then how do we go through that discernment? It's very easy to live a bifurcated life, but how do we go through that discernment that pulls us into making sure that our civil society, that our government comports will, with the will of God. This is where I think we go back to the prayer of Moses. The first two parts of the prayer of Moses are, Lord God, we want to be your people. And God says, okay, that's cool. Uh, and Lord God, I know that I need to be a leader here. Yeah, you do. And then Moses, total lack of humility says, he's on a roll, total lack of humility says, okay, show me your glory. And what does God say? Fat chance, Moses. Right? He says, no, that's not how it works, Moses. That is not how it works. How it works is like this. You get in that position of respect. You get in that position of listening to me and not telling me what you want. And I'll show you this. I will go by you. You'll be in the cave. I will put my hand up so you can't see me. You can't see my glory until I am past. And then I'll pull my hand away and you can see me walk away. I'm going to come back to that because I think that ties in to something uh, important. But it's very interesting, right, that you can have that in that prayer that Moses loses his humility. And God still says, well, okay, look, I know, I know who you are, but this is what I will do, right? So how do we then deal with the question of civil society, government, and our lives. So we know that there are certain things in the gospel that we must do that are clear commandments if we're followers of Jesus. 
And then there are some things that we're not clear about and how do we apply what Jesus talked about in our concrete situation. We know that we have to feed the poor, the hungry. We know we have to give drink to people who are thirsty. We know we have to take care of older people, that we have to take care of the widows, as it's put here. We know we have to work for peace. We know we have to visit people in jail. These are all what we have subscribed to as Christians, right? But there are other issues we don't quite know how to deal with. And when we deal with them, we have to start with what, does, what is the will of God and how does our society jive with that? So I work at St. James. My community is an immigrant community. I have uh, people in the congregation represent seven different uh, countries um, south of the river. So what's the role of civil society with regard to immigrants? Right? What is the command of Jesus to people leaving their homes, walking across Mexico, going through the Darien Gap, dealing with the cartel, seeing bodies that are already, people that have already died, scattered around them, walking, 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 leaving their homes because they, they can't deal with the poverty and the oppression. What's our role? Our bishop has already told us that putting the barbed wire across the river is not Christian, let alone humane. What is our role, right? This is what I'm talking about, that we can't separate the coin. It's one coin, one coin. Under God, what belongs to God. So none of this is easy. None of this is easy. None of this is easy. Teresa of Avila, the great Christian mystic in Spain, has this great story. So Teresa was uh, reforming the convents in Spain. She reformed 16 convents of nuns, right? the laxity that was going on. This is right after the time of Martin Luther, who himself was fingering the laxity of the church. So Teresa of Avila is one step ahead of the Inquisition in Spain because she's not totally very orthodox. But, the, but here's the story. So Teresa had, had to travel at night to these different convents throughout Spain. And I always pictured her, you know, you know, the silhouette of Teresa on her horse riding across the plains in Spain or in the mountains, you know, with all her religious gear blowing in the wind, you know. I love that picture. But she also traveled by cart with two burros. And you can imagine how comfortable that is. And during the night. And one night, she's out traveling going to another convent and her cart tips over and she falls in this muddy river. And she is really unhappy about this. Wet, dirty, carts flipped over and she's complaining to God, to Jesus. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Look, I'm your friend. Why are you treating me like this? And Jesus says, yeah, well, this is how I treat all my friends. And she says, well, no wonder you don't have very many. <laughs> but that points to the heart difficulty many times of us following Jesus. Even though we say we love Jesus, we follow Jesus, do we do it the way that we should do it? So, let's come back to that third part of the prayer of Moses, right? Moses, I'll let you see my glory after I have passed. And I think what's going on here 
is that the message is God will work in the community and watch for it. We see God working in the community. You know, most of us would say, yeah, Teresa, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, that's God working in the community. And we all in our lives have seen instances where we have said, yeah, that's God working in our community. I think that that's what prayer is about. Whatever leadership is, you are called to do, and we all have different kinds of leadership, it's about building community. It's about letting the glory of God manifest itself, let God manifest God in our daily lives. How do we do that? How do we do that with respect to immigration? How do we do that? We know wages are awful for workers. And if you're an immigrant, you're not even getting paid that scant minimum wage. We tolerate that. We tolerate the expense of uh, our, our taxes for military operations that we may not quite see how they comport with the will of God. And of course, we have great influence in the way that we vote. This is how we vote. This is how we live. Society needs to be in conformity with the will of God. And that's what Paul is saying in the letter to Thessalonica. Letter to you. You all have gone through, as any church has, a lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff. But have remained united in the faith, united in supporting each other, united in helping each other. That's what Paul is admiring in Thessalonica, in the letter to the people of Thessalonica. And he's saying, he says, you know, you are reflecting Jesus, and I'm proud of you. So I think this is something I would call you to think about today not just while you're sitting here listening to me, but maybe later on today, is how are we living in our society? What are we doing in our society to make sure that it does reflect, does comport with the will of God? Who needs our support? How can we do it? What should we do? So that's gonna be the message I leave with you today. No answers but a call to discernment, a call to strengthen our community, to strengthen your community, a call to strengthen our larger community, a call to make civil society more in conformity with God. And all of this, of course, is the call to love one another. Rabbi Tarfin, commenting on Mike the Six, has this to say, and this I leave with you. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justice now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. resurrection. Let us proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God for true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated by the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who were in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Andy, Kay, Jeff, and Hector, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Atia, Joy, Harry, Mike, Sally, Elizabeth, Jean, Laura, Ben, Joyce, Jeanette, Helen, Will, Ryan, Nancy, Todd, Mary Ann, Bishop Curry, Marcia, Lynn, Ian, Kenyon, Kale, Daniel, the Diebolt family, the Graves family, and the Klein family. Who else are we praying for? Hear us, Lord. We are mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, especially Donna, Joanne. Ruth Ann, Mark, and Anne. By their others. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth. And establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, God. giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church. And so guide the minds of those who shall choose the rector for this church, that we may receive the faithful pastor who will care for your people and equip us for our 
God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with each and every one of you this morning. Also with you. Peace be with you. I was saying a few minutes ago, you'll be doing God's work. Um, we also need a couple or three people that would like to go and have a good time at the diocesan council. We don't have to drive all the way to Galveston this year. We only have to drive to Waco. And uh, if you've never been, you need to go and just see what all goes on when the entire diocese comes together and celebrates uh, just the church service alone is, is just really worth, worth it. Um, we have someone to speak to us today about money. Um, Jim was talking about a coin a few minutes ago, and that that coin did have two sides to it. All right. So who was, who's, who's our guest speaker today? Thanks. Joe, Mr. Joe Robertson, who has served on Vestry many, many times yeah. and would love to pass the baton. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice. The weather's gotten so much better, and all our allergies have gone the other way. <laughs> so I'm up here to talk about stewardship. Everybody in this building knows what stewardship is. I see all of you do it all the time. I've seen it for years and years and years. But today it's about money stewardship. It took a walk this morning, went to the mailbox, and y'all remember when you used to get mail? 
You know, you get all your bills, credit cards, all that fun stuff would be in there. And sometimes, once a year, get your class card. Back then, I made the mistake of treating it kind of like a bill. It got put in a pile on my desk, paid the bills, and I would get to get. Well, I've come to understand that this is not a bill, it's a gift. It's an opportunity. It's hope. It's the future. All the things that are on here are something you could do and probably have done if you're sitting in these people. So what I want you to do when you do your prayerful consideration about this is think about where we can go, where you can go. What happens if you stretch just a little bit this year, not only with your checkbook, but with yourselves? Vicki can come up with a hundred things for you to do right now. <laughs> Some of them you've never even thought of. Think about it, give it a shot, you never know. The one thing I knew, do know talking about stewardship, the most important thing is brevity. So thank you all very much, <laughs> prayerful considerations, and let's get these turned in. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I can see them digging in their pockets right now, Joe, so we're good. We're good. Uh, a few more things. Uh, there is a very short outreach meeting right after the service. Just stay in the church. Don't go anywhere. Uh, and Kathy wants to talk to you about serving at Oak uh, Trails, and uh, it'll just take a few minutes at, at the most. Uh, I would also like to mention to you about the gathering this month. I was so excited after church last week. I had told you that we're gonna have 12 seats on golf carts to go tour communities first. And many of you said to me right after church, oh, Vicki, I wanna go. Well, Vicki got home and couldn't remember everybody that told her she what they wanted to go. So if you would like to go on this thing, you do need to email me, please. And it's just Vicki <coughs> at stchristophersaustin.org. Um, also, one more thing, um, there's a baby shower right after the service, after the, the little short outreach service or meeting, and you are invited to come. It is not the presence that, with the tea that you are asked to bring, it is your presence that they would like to have. So don't feel obligated to have a goodie to come and share your love for this new grandbaby that Liz is gonna have and Trinity's going to have. So please uh, feel free to come, even if you don't have a goodie to leave. Um, I think Kathy has a few things to say about Thanksgiving, and then we'll get back to church. Just to carry on with what Joe said, the end gathering of our pledges will be on the 19th which traditionally we also have as a Thanksgiving potluck. So we're back to doing it again. If you're called to uh, bring a dish, I've got a little sign-up sheet. It's the peripheral. It's the not quite done one yet, but I could get into the office to get the one that uh, Alan has been working on. Alan's been very busy with his graphic art. So we just want to encourage you, we need helpers to set up, we need helpers to take down, to serve, to bring food. It's going to be a great gathering. Oh, the men's fellowship are doing the turkeys. So don't, we don't have to worry about them.
suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. supper he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this for the remembrance of me Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink 
of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this, this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ our Pas Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
blessing of God, of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.